I'm Tim Potts, director of the uh, Getty Museum, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for this, um, which is the um, eighth of the annual, no, the seventh of the annual Villa Presents lectures. These are lectures supported by the um, Getty Villa Council, and the purpose of them is to promote a dialogue on the influence and relevance of antiquity, and it's indeed its continuing relevance and importance to our understanding of culture and art and literature today. Um, it's a very important function that it serves, and indeed the, uh, the interest of our collections is very much related to how we can continue to interpret them and make them interesting and meaningful to uh, people, the, the culture that we ourselves live in. There could be no more appropriate um, lecturer to celebrate um, this theme than Stephen um, Greenblatt, today's uh, speaker. If indeed, if you, as it were, sat down with a blank piece of paper and said, well, let's invent a person who uh, does the sort of work that makes the ancient world uh, and its interpretation in later ages come to life and, and, and be relevant, and let's imagine that he writes a book um, that does that related to a particular object or group of objects, you would invent Stephen Greenblatt and you would invent the swerve as the topic of his lecture. So we're delighted that we didn't have to invent him. He already exists and we were able to invite him here tonight. Um, his talk will take us back in time, but starting not with antiquity in the way our collections do, but in a sense in reverse with an Italian humanist who discovers a wonderful manuscript in the early 15th century, the early modern period, which had indeed been copied and recopied from antiquity, which takes us back to the Rome of the first century BC when Lucretius <laughs> lived, and indeed takes us back in a way to this building, or at least the one just over there, which is the recreation of the Villa of the Papyri, since it was in that villa that many of the documents that relate to the philosophical tradition of Epicureanism and in which Lucretius worked uh, were found. So the, the, the appropriateness of the lecture is not only this approach to the subject, but indeed to the very place in which many of these documents were found uh, and from which this story um, unfolds. So we're delighted to have him with us here tonight to lecture. Just a few words on his um, uh, very distinguished career. He is the Kogan University Professor of the Humanities at Harvard University. He's been the author of some 12 books, including, of course, The Swerve, How the World Became Modern, and Shakespeare's Freedom, and Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare, which was in the New York Times bestseller list for some nine weeks. And as, of course, as well as being a student of the ancient world, he's perhaps best known as a scholar on Shakespeare and the Renaissance, late Renaissance literature generally. Other books include Hamlet in Purgatory, Marvelous Possessions, and Renaissance Self-Fashioning. He's been the general editor of the Norton Anthology of English Literature and of the Norton Shakespeare, and has edited seven collections of criticism and is a founding editor of the journal Representations. He, of course, recently was awarded the 2012 Pulitzer Prize and the 2011 National Book Award for The Swerve. Uh, many other uh, accolades which I won't um, mention, um, but perhaps pick out just a few Harvard University's Cabot Fellowship, the Distinguished Humanist Award from the Mellon Foundation, Yale's Wilbur Cross Medal, the William Shakespeare Award for Classical Theater, the Erasmus Institute Prize, et cetera, et cetera, and the list does go on. He's held, of course, many uh, distinguished visiting professorships, has been president of the Modern Language Association of America, and a permanent fellow of the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin, and of course, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and beyond that sort of litany, if you like, of achievements, he's been, even more importantly, a major figure in the development of a new way of approaching literature and history, what's called, perhaps, um, uh, tried, summed up all too blandly, but in the, the, under the rubric of the new historicism. But it has set in train a whole new way of um, thinking about the relationship between literature and history and how they interact, which has been you know, one of the major developments in uh, the most inventive and innovative 
uh, research in these fields in recent years. So we hugely look forward to his talk tonight. It's not on the screen anymore, but it will be in a second on Lucretius and the toleration of intolerable ideas. Professor Scream. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, to the director, to Bart, uh, to the Getty Council uh, for this wonderful invitation, to you all for being willing to come in out of this uh, exquisite, luminous evening into a dark room. Uh, and uh, to talk about the intolerable. Uh, it is a particular pleasure to do so in this special context, as uh, Tim has already explained, because we are in uh, this fantastic recreation of the place uh, where uh, the story, in some ways, uh, that I have to tell centers, which is that something was set off, in effect, uh, in... Uh, and around the first century uh, before the Christian era, in the Bay of Naples, particularly, not only there, but in the Bay of Naples, a kind of resurgence, a very powerful uh, resurgence in the waning days of the Roman Republic, uh, of the philosophy of Epicureanism. Uh, we know much about this because in the site, not nearly so beautiful as the villa that you're in now, uh, which is the recreation, but in the site at Herculaneum, there were a set of discoveries uh, made in the uh, 18th century that took us uh, back, took the world back deeply into uh, that lost uh, world, the world that was represented by these weird looking objects which are carbonized papyrus rolls, uh, though it was first assumed that they might be charcoal briquettes. Uh, and uh, what was discovered uh, was a set of philosophical works by uh, a philosopher named Philodemus. They're hoping to find something uh, by more uh, illustrious philosophers, but they found an Epicurean philosopher uh, who was either collected or perhaps lived for a while uh, in uh, this villa, perhaps to teach uh, in the villa uh, to instruct the uh, very wealthy people uh, who owned it. Uh, and that philosophy of Epicureanism is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, the villa, as you probably know, is only very partially excavated. Here's a rather blurry slide of current excavations uh, going on in Herculaneum. And it's quite possible that in that extension, the extension of the rooms that, uh, where the uh, papyruses were found, there'll be more discoveries uh, of manuscripts of lost uh, works uh, from the ancient world. So we're only really beginning, only a very small part of the enormous area around the villa of the papyruses and indeed of Herculaneum has been excavated. So it's possible that we'll find more, more that will enable us to uh, recover, to get back uh, to in touch with the particular form of intense intelligence uh, that we can perhaps glimpse or at least imagine we glimpse in some of the faces that we see uh, in the works of art that have been recovered from Herculaneum and that grace uh, the museums of the, uh, in the world and above all uh, grace the, this particular uh, magnificent collection uh, in the Getty Villa. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is how what came back uh, with uh, the recovery of Epicureanism uh, and the particular recovery that, uh, that which we'll look at in, in a little bit later in the 15th century, how what came back managed to get through at all. Because all cultures, not just uh, medieval culture, but all cultures, including our own, develop ways of stabilizing themselves by not allowing uh, the most disturbing ideas uh, to penetrate. And uh, as I'll have occasion to try to explain, late uh, medieval culture, late antique and medieval culture developed very powerful mechanisms to push off, as, a, as if a disease or an infection, to push away uh, ideas that were too uh, disturbing. Uh, I looked today, uh, thanks to one of the members uh, of uh, the Getty Council, uh, at a remarkable image that you can see for yourself uh, here uh, of, the, of a head of Venus with a cross uh, incised in it and the eyes gouged out. Uh, and that will actually be a perfect introduction to uh, the problem that I want to begin with today. Uh, I'll begin uh, here uh, 
with one of the master builders, the master builder of Christian orthodoxy, uh, St. Augustine. What death is worse for the soul, Augustine wrote, than the freedom to err, to make a mistake. Uh, among these uh, powerful figures, uh, the people who formed uh, Christianity uh, in the fourth century and onward, there was little tolerance for anything that we would call toleration. Though they themselves had been persecuted, of course, uh, once in power, Christians moved as quickly as they could uh, to suppress rival forms of worship. And in doing so, they, in effect, confirmed the charges that had led to the persecutions against them in the first place. That is to say, uh, pagan intellectuals had said that Christians could not be uh, tolerated, uh, couldn't be treated in the same way that the state authorities in the Roman Republic and later the empire had ordinarily treated newly encountered uh, religions because Christianity wouldn't be assimilated. It wouldn't allow its reigning divinity to be aligned uh, with the existing panoply of the pagan gods. Not only was Christianity monotheistic and hence unwilling to acknowledge the existence of other gods, it was also Catholic in the sense of universal and hence committed to urging everyone to abandon time-honored religious practices. A succession of Christian emperors beginning with Theodosius the, the Great in 391 of the Christian era issued edicts forbidding public sacrifices and one after the other closing uh, cultic sites. So the state had embarked on the destruction of paganism. Uh, is it not true uh, that we are dead, writes one of the pagan poets in the wake of the destruction of the Serapian in Alexandria? We are living, we're living a life that's like a dream since we remain alive while our way of life is dead and gone. Uh, Pallidus had intuited that his world was sliding into the strange state of suspended animation of living death that is the fate of cultural relics in most of our collections, where they represent something beautiful perhaps, but something that is fundamentally dead, uh, whose world, whose life world has passed away. To its monotheism and its universalism, uh, Christianity conjoined a commitment to a single absolute doctrinal coherence or to a dream of coherence that was alien to both pagan and religious, uh, to pagan and Jewish uh, traditions. The ancient rabbis, as you probably know, hurled fierce charges against each other. They loved to fight, uh, but uh, the rabbis never were able, at least not until Maimonides, the rabbis were never able to even imagine a coherent philosophical system, the possibility of a resolution, the resolution that was the dream, uh, in effect, of uh, the most ambitious Christian theologians. The spirit of the Talmud is obviously quite distinct from the spirit of pagan religious speculation of the kind that you find in works like Cicero's uh, On the Nature of the Gods, but in both you find a sense that there'll always be multiple competing schools uh, that will be fighting it out. Augustine, and above all Augustine, set in motion the search, which he understood would never be complete until the end of time, for a theology that was not fragile or revisable or diverse, but was unshakable, unchangeable, and coherent. And the motivation was not only a, sing a certain kind of philosophical ambition, though it was philosophical ambition on uh, plenty of it on Augustine's part, but also a particular concern for the state of the soul. Christian orthodoxy could not tolerate false belief for the same reason that the state, as Thomas More put it centuries later, the state could not tolerate the sale of poisoned bread. You can't allow this, you can't allow this kind of harm to come to the unsuspecting. And hence that question with which we began, uh, what death is worse for the soul and the freedom to err? The question was posed, as the title of Augustine's work suggests, in the context of the debate with a particular heretical group called the Donatists, and it directs us to a crucial feature of Christian orthodoxy in those early centuries. Particularly intense persecutory, pers uh, persecutorial attention was paid not to the relics of vanquished beliefs, and not even to rival faiths, 
but to deviations often quite subtle within the one true faith. Uh, the word heresy derives from uh, the Greek term hieresis, which signifies precisely choice. And it's precisely choice and the attendant ideas, the idea that there might be multiple competing positions among which you could choose that theological absolutism decisively rejected. In its place, there was at least the dream of, of finding a single truth and a determination to weed out all false beliefs, to protect people from uh, harm to their souls. For Augustine, the key biblical text, and Augustine knew that he was uh, trying to affect a radical change from the culture in which he had been raised, the culture in which there were competing positions in which you could walk uh, from one school uh, to the other and argue, here the Stoics argue with the Epicureans, uh, the Epicureans with the academics and so forth. Augustine turned to a biblical text uh, to justify uh, his view. And the text was uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares. I confess to you I had to look up what tares were when I saw it, meaning uh, obnoxious weed like darnel or vetch, uh, from Matthew book 13. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and also brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Well, that's the problem, and the parable goes on. Uh, the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath the tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Now, this would seem like the least likely text in support of a program of vigorous uh, persecution of heretics. Uh, but Augustine... Uh, doesn't see it that way. Uh, it's true that the tares in this text didn't spring up naturally. They were planted by the enemy. Their very existence calls into question the goodness of the seed. Uh, it's true that the master tells the servants not to pull up the weeds for fear of destroying the wheat, and the argument would seem to be, therefore, in favor of something like toleration, of the kind that Milton proposed in the 17th century in the Areopagitica. You'd have to be willing to tolerate Milton thought you had to tolerate lies to be circulated because that's the only way to find the truth. Uh, but Augustine doesn't see it that way. And in a very influential interpretive move of the kind that intellectuals are good at and in general, and Augustine, as the greatest of all intellectuals, was tremendously good at, uh, he argues against what seems to be the surface implication of Jesus' words, that the parable properly understood licenses and, in fact, requires heresy hunting. Um, Augustine writes that the only reason that the master left the tares to grow until the harvest was fear that uprooting them sooner would harm the grain. When this fear does not exist, because it's evident which is the good seed and which is the weed, uh, when, it's, when someone's crime is notorious and so execrable that it's indefensible, then it's right to use severe discipline against it for the more perversity is corrected, the more carefully charity is safeguarded. So the violent extirpation of false beliefs has to be understood as in the service of charity. And I think that is very much what Augustine believed. For the parable's cautionary words applied only to the period before the seed had ripened and grown. Now we dis know decisively which is the wheat and which is the weed. Uh, that's the point of having doctrine. Uh, it's appropriate to act precisely as the closing words of Jesus' parable propose. And now, under this move that Augustine makes, the closing words of Jesus' parable begin to have a slightly chilling ring. Let both grow together till the harvest, and in the time of harvest I'll say to the reapers, gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Uh, I think we can be reasonably sure Jesus is not imagining people burned at the stake here, but it is, in effect, uh, what the interpretation of the parable seems to license uh, Augustine uh, to counsel 
and after Augustine, uh, centuries uh, of um, people interested in saving humans from grievous error. When the full power of the state was mobilized in support of the fateful conjunction of monotheism and universalism and doctrinal absolutism, the consequence was a programmatic, principled, on a, and on occasion murderous intolerance. Now, the fact is that in everyday life, men and women, for long periods of time, all through late antiquity and the Middle Ages, uh, managed to find some way of uh, getting along with their neighbors and with their family members. The differences could on occasion erupt into conflict, even violent conflict, but for the most part they simmered quietly and uneasily. But the principle at least was clear. Heresy was classified as a capital crime, worse, as Aquinas puts it, uh, worse than uh, forgery and justified uh, not only by justifying not only excommunication but death. There are conflicting accounts of the process through which the world escaped from this nightmare, insofar as it did escape it. And the Renaissance clearly played an important role uh, through the process of the revaluation of pagan antiquity, uh, through the unsettling impact of new world discoveries, through the slow growth of philosophical skepticism and the widespread popular revulsion in the wake of the religious wars uh, and the determination of secular rulers to achieve some kind of pragmatic solution to popular disorder, to quiet things down. Uh, but the issues were by no means quickly or decisively resolved. Uh, John Locke's celebrated letter concerning toleration, which was first published anonymously in Latin in the Netherlands in 1689, declared flatly that the care of every man's soul belongs unto himself and is to be left to himself. But even here, 1689, at what must by anyone's account by, be the extreme outer end, the far end of the Renaissance, very few of his contemporaries agreed, uh, or at least were willing publicly to declare that they agreed with this simple uh, prescription. That's why it was published anonymously in Latin and in the Netherlands. <laughs> <clears throat> Belief in one religion or another, Locke argued, could not be compelled, and dissent from one religion or another shouldn't be punished. For all the life and power of true religion consists in the inward and full persuasion of the mind, he wrote. And faith is not faith without believing. The church has to be free and voluntary, he thought. I may grow rich by an art that I take not delight in. I may be cured of some disease by remedies that I have not faith in, he wrote, anticipating uh, many uh, remedies that we all uh, choose for ourselves, not fully having faith in, but hoping that we'll be cured. But I cannot be saved by a religion that I distrust and by a worship that I abhor. Uh, and as for orthodoxy, uh, Locke wrote in one of my favorite uh, formulations, everyone is orthodox uh, to himself. Now, it's very important to realize that even in late 17th century Protestant England, and these are highly Protestant propositions, uh, these views were widely and vehemently attacked by everyone, Protestants uh, as well, uh, as far beyond the pale of what was acceptable, and that Locke himself articulated a significant exception. Those are not at all to be tolerated, he wrote, who deny the being of a god. Why? Why, if religion consists of the inward and full persuasion of the mind, uh, as, he, as he himself has put it, should toleration not extend to those whose minds are unpersuaded? Because, he says, promises, covenants, and oaths, which are the bonds of human society, can have no hold upon an atheist. Uh, that is to say, as you will notice, the argument doesn't focus on the afterlife, on the saving of the soul. It, it's on the here and now. How do you get along with people? How do you trust people? Uh, and you can't trust them in ordinary uh, human society, in ordinary, all matters of ordinary human bonds, if they don't at least have a minimal belief uh, in God. The taking away of God, though, but even in thought, he says, dissolves all. Though, but even in thought. Here, 
at the very end of this period, 1689, the very late 17th century, we find in the work of one of the most daring and enlightened minds uh, of all time, uh, a clear limit to what can be tolerated, what it can be allowed through. And it's a limit that strikingly echoes a position that was articulated 150 years before Locke uh, at the very beginning of the English Renaissance by another daring and enlightened mind, the Catholic Thomas More. Uh, Utopus, who was the founder of the Commonwealth that bears his name, Utopia, had ruled absolutely astonishingly from the point of view of Moore's Europe that it should be lawful for every man to follow the religion of his choice. You should understand that utopia means no place. No place in uh, the early 16th century would have actually embraced formally uh, such a notion that everyone should be uh, free to follow the religion of his choice. Uh, as long as he isn't too vehement in trying to persuade others, Utopus writes. But one position is not only discouraged, but is prohibited. Uh, the, the ruler, Utopus, conscientiously and strictly gave injunction that no one should fall so far below the dignity of human nature as to believe that souls likewise perish with the body, or that the world is the mere sport of chance and not governed by any divine providence. So more gets us close to understanding what the minimal, specifically what the minimal belief tests would be. You have to believe uh, that the world is not the, sport of, is not the sport of chance. It's not the product of randomness. It's created by a designer. And that there is a, an afterlife of punishments uh, and rewards. Uh, why? Uh, because who can doubt, Moore says, that anyone uh, who does not have these principles will strive either to evade by craft the public laws of his country or to break them by violence in order to serve his private desires when he has nothing to fear but laws and no hope beyond the body. So that question uh, conjures up the specter that haunts even the most radical Renaissance defenses of toleration and Moore's utopia and Locke's uh, letter on toleration are the most radical. We've reached the limit case, the point at which the earliest Renaissance moment in England and the latest are conjoined in this strange mystic marriage uh, of the implacable Catholic saint and the Protestant philosopher of the liberal enlightenment, who both agree this is intolerable. We can't allow that set of positions to get through. OK, uh, that's a quick picture of what the problem is. And here's what happened. Uh, the loss of almost the entire corpus of materialist philosophy, the school of Democritus, Leucippus, and Epicurus, the school that believed that there was no providential creator and that there was no afterlife, uh, that loss was not completely accidental. Some, somewhat accidental, but not completely. Paganism, Judaism, and Christianity found a great deal to admire in Plato and Aristotle, and they had significant motives, therefore, for preserving at least some of their works. Atomism invited no comparable accommodation. Uh, when there was an attempt to revive paganism uh, in the earlier fourth century under someone named Julian the Apostate, and they drew up a list of things that pagan priests should read to try to learn how to be pagans again, uh, they excluded the works of Epicureans. They said that wasn't appropriate. Jews likewise call people who, who don't believe, people who are atheists, apikoiros, Epicureans. And Christians uh, similarly condemned uh, Epicureanism as the enemy of religion. All the works of Democritus and Leucippus have vanished. Almost all of the works of uh, Epicurus are gone. And it's all the more surprising then that a single magnificent, astonishing, long work of this philosophical school got through. Uh, the work called On the Nature of Things, De Rerum Natura, uh, by Lucretius. That it survived depended almost entirely on the vagaries of the monastic scriptorium. Someone, we don't know whom, uh, was assigned the task uh, in a monastery sometime probably in the 8th century uh, to copy all 7,400 lines of Lucretius's poem, and save it from rotting away. It probably happened once or twice. Uh, the key principle in general is that if, as far as material texts, 
is that if it got copied in the 8th century, it stood a very good chance of making it through. If it didn't get copied in the 8th century, it was curtains uh, for uh, the text, because the stuff doesn't last that long. It lasts a long time, but not that long, and has to be copied. Um, okay, two moments are crucial. There's this moment uh, of the monk, and there was a moment, again, uh, fortuitous. Let's say this was in the 8th century, possibly late 7th, 8th century, there was the moment in 1417 in which the man whose handwriting you see here signs himself Poggio the Florentine. Uh, he f was a book hunter and a papal bureaucrat, and he found the manuscript of De Reum Natura, uh, had a copy made, and sent it to his friend and fellow humanist Niccolo Niccoli uh, in Florence to be copied. And that's Niccolo Niccoli's copy, which is in the Laurentian Library in Florence, and I've held this in my trembling hands. Uh, uh, since I've written a book about this uh, moment of the discovery in 1417 and how this transmission got through, I will not uh, dwell on it here except to say that that's, this, is the, the, this is the moment in which it comes back uh, in this strange way, one huge lump uh, of antiquity that was recovered. The central proposition of Lucretius' great poem, that the universe consists of atoms and emptiness, uh, was not the dominant view of Poggio's world in 1417, but it wouldn't have come as a complete surprise. People always knew that the world was made of something, and they also understood that you could cut up the something in smaller and smaller bits. So there were people uh, in, in the monasteries of the Middle Ages who had notions of uh, that, that there was a theory in the ancient world uh, of atomism, that, they were, that the universe was put together out of tiny, uh, uh, indivisible in, in substances. But no one was prepared for the full implications of the interlocking argument that Lucretius' work brought back. It was one thing to think that the world is made up out of atoms. It's another thing to understand what that means uh, philosophically. For Lucretius argued not only that the world is made up out of an infinite number of indestructible tiny particles, he called them first beginnings, or the seeds of things, uh, but also that nothing else existed, no other forms of being, and thus no immaterial demons or angels uh, or ghosts, and no bodiless immortal souls, souls that don't have, are not made of matter. And what followed uh, from this was a textbook succession of unacceptable, intolerable propositions of the kind that gave Moore and Locke, along with just about everyone else, very, very bad dreams. Uh, so I'll very quickly rehearse uh, some of the propositions because it's crucial that you know what was coming suddenly back uh, against this very tight mesh this, uh, that was meant to block the circulation precisely of these thoughts. First of all, the universe has no creator uh, or designer. Uh, the particles themselves have not been made and cannot be destroyed. The, and the problem here is not, that, uh, not only that the universe was uncreated and, and immortal, because that thought actually, in a way, European philosophy had already grappled with in the thought of Aristotle, but it was also that it happened without any design, without any divine control, that it was without the help of the gods, per se sponte, spontaneously. It happens not because anyone is uh, making it happen. And then nature ceaselessly and randomly experiments. Uh, scripture understood, was understood to mean that God had created all the species that existed in the first six days. Um, mutations were observed, of course, but they were not part of an ongoing, evolving life process. And a strong bias uh, toward design, toward thinking that things had to be made, made it extremely difficult uh, to understand what Lucretius was getting at when he was, uh, or to take in, to tolerate what he was getting at when he said that the universe was constantly, nature was constantly throwing up weird mutant forms, hermaphrodites, things with strange physical features and so forth and so on, and that these things were not happening on purpose, they were happening spontaneously. Nothing is born in us simply in order that we may use it, but that which is born, he wrote, creates the use. That's actually an extremely tricky thought, one that is difficult for, I think still quite difficult uh, 
to take in, uh, including the notion, as he puts it, that there was no sight before the eyes were born, no speaking of words before the tongue. You, the eye didn't evolve in order to let you see. It doesn't happen that way. No one is planning things in that form. Uh, this notion was bizarre and uh, incomprehensible, really, to most people until Darwin, and even now is very hard to get hold of. And then the world was not created for or about humans. There was, Lucretius thought, no original paradisal state designed to make humans feel at home. As a species, we make our way through an environment that's hostile, uh, and we're very vulnerable. Uh, he writes in a famous passage uh, asking you to contemplate a baby thrown up against uh, into the shores of light, wailing, uh, speechless, utterly helpless. Uh, early humans, and we'll come back to this notion, he thought were extremely primitive. He had absolutely no patience for the idea that there was an original golden age in which humans were perfect and then devolved from that. He thought humans must have originated in brutish form and very, very slowly moved toward anything that resembled civility. He didn't think they had got very far. Uh, he wasn't a huge fan uh, of his own uh, world, but they had definitely made progress. Uh, and they had made progress with the limited things that they had. They weren't very well made. He has, Lucretius has a sense, how shall we say, of the principle of the prostate, that the humans aren't all that well designed. If there were, were a designer, uh, the designer had failed in se several crucial uh, respects. Um, the fate of the entire species is not the pole around which everything revolves. Uh, indeed, there's no reason, he thought, to believe that our species would last forever. Things are always coming into being. He thought there were creatures, other species before humans existed. There would be other species after humans ceased to exist in the world. Things would constantly get thrown up. And because humans are not, he thought, unique. Um, he thought they were not unique, not only as a species, but uh, they were not unique in what they were made of. It sounds good that we're, we're all sprung from celestial seed, as he puts it, but what he means by that is that we're made up out of the same atoms that everything else is made up out of, that water is made up out of, this table is made up out of, out of. It's just all a certain limited repertory of atoms that are coming together in different forms. There's nothing, there's no special human atoms uh, that make us uh, significantly unique. Um, our lives <clears throat> can be analyzed in the same terms, he thought, that could be used to analyze all other creatures that forage for food or experience the drive to reproduce uh, their kind. And then he thought that the soul dies. He thought the soul dies because the soul was made of matter. Uh, and he thought, we'll come back to this too, is a bit of a problem, he thought this was good news. Uh, <laughs> death, he says, is nothing to us. Uh, we, won't, we don't have anything to worry about. Uh, we didn't worry about things before we were alive, and we won't worry about things uh, after we're dead. We don't have to be concerned that anything is going to happen uh, to us uh, in an afterlife. And therefore, uh, he thought, well, organized religions are superstitious delusions. He thought that humans project their desires and fears uh, onto certain imaginary creatures, and they get trapped up in false beliefs. Uh, Lucretius believed, as the philosopher Vico also believed in the 18th century, that uh, lightning and thunder play an important part in the origins of religion. He thought that humans respond instinctively to very loud noises by starting to pray. Uh, <laughs> and the trouble is that praying, he thought, was futile. Uh, the horrors that are imagined in the afterlife are only things that we do in this life because religions are part of a system that actually is quite cruel. They promise love and hope, but their deep underlying structure, he thought, uh, was based on anxiety and retribution. Uh, the quintessential emblem for Lucretius of what was wrong with religion uh, was the sacrifice. He thought religions always came back to stories of the sacrifice of a child by its parent. It's actually a very peculiar thing. I think it's doubtful that he knew the story of Abraham and Isaac. He certainly didn't, he's writing in the year 50 before the Christian era, see, at the time of Julius Caesar, he certainly didn't know the story uh, that was going to be told in 50 years uh, time uh, by the Christians, but he did know the story of Agamemnon and Iphigenia, and it's probably that uh, that is his focus 
here, the sacrifice of a child by a parent in the name of religion. Uh, he thought that the uh, solution, insofar as there was a solution, was not to attribute the miseries of the world uh, to uh, the punishments by God and to torture oneself and religious belief, but rather uh, to pursue pleasure and to try to reduce pain for oneself and others. There's no higher ethical purpose than that, he thought. This is the ultimate good. Uh, all other claims, the service of the state, the glorification of the gods or the glorification of the ruler, the arduous pursuit of virtue through self-sacrifice, such as uh, Stoics would have believed, all of the other values that were so important, actually, in, in first century BCE uh, Rome, he thought were misguided or fraudulent. Militarism and the taste of violent sports that characterized so much of Roman culture uh, seemed to Lucretius in the deepest sense perverse and unnatural. Uh, by pursuit of pleasure, he didn't think that you needed to live um, in the villa of the papyri, though it would have been nice. He thought uh, what you needed was uh, very, very little. Uh, you, didn't, you don't feel better, he says, uh, if you have a fever, if you have a very expensive blanket on you, then if you have a less expensive blanket, you just need a blanket. Uh, that's the general uh, picture. Now, um, almost all of these propositions, virtually all of them, would have seemed scandalous uh, to the early 15th century. Uh, the early 15th century that was the heir to a rich centuries-old culture that worshipped an omnipotent, omniscient, creator God, that celebrated spiritual transcendence, that longed for the redemption of the soul, that constantly reminded itself of the atoning value of pain, of suffering, and of renunciation. And the fact that Lucretius's poem and the whole Epicurean philosophical discourse in which it participated had virtually completely dropped from view for centuries before it came back in 1417. I mean, almost no mention of it, tiny glimpses of it in the, uh, in the 8th century, in the 9th century, and then silence for centuries until it suddenly comes back. The fact that it came back so suddenly made it all the more shocking. Because important texts by ancient philosophers, by Plato, Aristotle, by Cicero and others, were also recovered during this period, but their reception was conditioned by a long process uh, of commentary and of appropriation, uh, so that by the time, certainly by early 15th century, Aristotle had, in effect, through the work of Thomas Aquinas, become a Christian philosopher. Uh, there was no such tradition for Lucretius. After a thousand years, uh, the better part of a thousand years of virtual silence, his return was in the deepest sense, uncanny, unheimlich. He spoke with supreme eloquence, but much of what he said seemed to a very few, uh, to all but a very few of Poggio's contemporaries, uh, as insofar as they could take it in at all, as monstrous, uh, or perhaps simply incomprehensible. As a young man, the most brilliant philosopher of the 15th century in Italy, Marsilio Ficino, began to write a commentary on Lucretius' De Rerum Natura, but seeing where it was leading him, he burned it. Uh, and spent the rest of his life trying to reconcile Plato uh, to Christianity. The return of De Rerum Natura was the Renaissance at its most radical. Uh, not a decorous, sedate recovery of classical harmonies, but a weird, unnerving challenge to everything that right-thinking people believed uh, to be true. A few odd forays, a few odd figures made forays uh, into the strange territory and decided to stay for a while. Uh, but for the most part, but for the most part, uh, people stayed away, all but a few. Uh, the most interesting, perhaps, of those in the very early years who ventured close were those who don't speak to us, but rather who paint uh, for us. Uh, this is a painting by that remarkable and very weird figure, Pierre de Cosimo, a uh, Florentine painter uh, of the uh, 15th century, and early 16th century, um, who did a series of works uh, 
for a group in Florence who evidently were interested in certain aspects, at least, of Lucretius's poem. Uh, this, is a poem this is a painting called The Forest Fire that is uh, very clearly based uh, on a reading of a passage from Lucretius precisely in which he's saying that humans originated, how did life, uh, a human life as we know it originated, originated in slow development of primitive peoples uh, out, of the out of the mastery of certain natural features such as the mastery of fire. Uh, when a, branch, a branching tree struck by wind, swaying and tossed about, leans on the branches of a tree, fire is pressed out uh, by the great force of the friction and we can see uh, fire coming out. Uh, on a clear day uh, in this form. And we're watching an early stage uh, as those who read uh, Lucretius uh, understood him to be saying of the origins uh, of human life as we know it. Or here, another painting, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a very good slide, <clears throat> of a hunt, uh, of an, uh, again, very closely based on passage in Lucretius about early humans uh, as hunters fighting beasts with ponderous clubs. And you can notice not only these are early humans, but they're also strange mutant types as well, or uh, halfway between uh, humans. And they're, they're of course, uh, Pierre de Cosimo could represent this, if you were asked, uh, as a satyr. But uh, these figures, these strange, odd figures with strange faces, uh, and shapes are almost certainly uh, those metamorphos, those mutant figures that Lucretius was imagining, other kinds of what we would call hominids uh, in the world before uh, humans uh, emerged. The point about this, and I'll come back to this in a, in a bit, is that um, uh, this could be an exception to the mechanism, uh, formal and informal, uh, of aversion and, and Repression, it could be a mechanism, it could be a, an aver a, a way of escaping uh, an, uh, an exception to those mechanisms because though paintings don't get a free ride completely, uh, basically the Inquisition is not called very often to uh, investigate painters uh, because painters don't speak out in the same way. You can play games and you can imagine what, as I say already, you can imagine what if he was asked, Pierre de Di Cosimo was a very strange man. He listed, lived at the end of his life on, on, only on hard-boiled eggs, which he uh, cooked 50 at a time. Uh, <laughs> and a very, very weird character. So people would just probably have shrugged and thought he was weird. Uh, but if asked, he could have had things to say to explain how he and the circle of people he was painting for at this point would have understood these scenes that would have enabled them to, uh, as it were, escape the net. Uh, the simple uh, existence of bad ideas from the past uh, was not the problem. The question was how close you could get to them in their seductive uh, form. Uh, for the better part of two centuries, the reception of Lucretius was fugitive in a way that it's fugitive in a painting like this. It wasn't until the late 16th century, almost 200 years after Poggio recovered the text, that Giordano Bruno ventured to propose as his own belief uh, the infinite universe, the ceaseless recombination of matter, the absence of providential design, the origination of human life in barbarous uh, primitive uh, states, and other distinctly Lucretian features. And for his efforts, Bruno was imprisoned and interrogated and tortured and finally led to the stake in the Campo di Fiori where his statue uh, now uh, stands in the middle of the fruit and vegetable market that many of you will have been to at some point. So the roughly 200 year time lag between the discovery of the text, 1417, and Bruno's fatal public advocacy of the central principles marks the historical conundrum that's my topic uh, tonight, and it extends really beyond as we saw from Locke, even beyond that 200-year period. Uh, because for decades and decades, no one could come forward safely and say, I think the world is made up out of atoms and void. 
that in body and soul were only fantastically complex structures of atoms uh, that are destined one day to come apart. And no respectable citizen could say the soul dies with the body. There's no judgment after death. The universe wasn't created for us by divine power. The whole notion of an afterlife is a superstitious fantasy, and we're not tainted with original sin. Uh, no one who wished to live in peace could stand up in public and say the preachers have been lying to us. God has no interest in our actions. And though nature is beautiful and it's intricate, it's not the product of an overarching intelligent design. For that matter, no one could stand up and hope to win public office in the United States and say those things. <laughs> uh, so the propositions were for the entirety of the Renaissance, the intolerable. And the poem nonetheless survived and was allowed to circulate. And the question is, why was that? How was the intolerable tolerated? And there are three answers that I want to propose quickly in closing. And the first has to do with what we could call readily strategies of avoidance. Uh, this is uh, a copy, it happens, of, of Lucretius. It was owned by Ben Johnson, uh, Shakespeare's friend. It's in the Houghton Library at, at Harvard. Uh, ben Johnson was a notorious drunkard, and he probably spilled ink and acid on his pages and messed it up. Uh, uh, but his comments are uh, scribbled uh, on the book. Uh, and indeed, you can uh, study, as people have studied, the... Um, the jottings, the underlinings, the asterisks, the little drawings of pointed fingers in the margins uh, of the, both the manuscripts and the printed copies uh, of Lucretius to see how people were reading the text. And what people uh, who have studied, uh, above all, a, a young uh, uh, historian named Ada Palmer, who's gone through the annotations in 54 surviving manuscripts, as well as the first four printed editions, uh, have found is that Renaissance readers tended not to make any marks in the margins next to the, any of the stuff that I showed you. None of the passages that I quoted uh, before, uh, earlier tonight, uh, have almost anything written in the margins uh, next to them in the text. No underlinings, nothing. Uh, so what's that about? Um, the, there were comments in the margins. They, uh, readers make philological comments. They comment on Latin and Greek vocabulary. They speculate on scansion, how, how you uh, count the syllables in the hexameters. They take notes on natural history and on Roman culture. Perhaps people were being very careful not to call attention to the really, uh, what, what Eric Idle calls the naughty bits uh, <laughs> in the poem. Uh, or perhaps their eyes uh, simply slipped over those passages in unconscious aversion to something that they considered disagreeable or weird uh, or merely foolish. And the second answer is related to the first and also related to what you're seeing, which is a printed edition of the text, and it has to do with scholarship. <coughs> scholarship turns out to play a role in the history of toleration. Uh, scholars set to work on what they took to be a poem uh, whose core vision of the world was, in effect, dead. Uh, they didn't w wish to call that world back into existence. In that sense, they weren't interested in what we call the Renaissance in the literal sense of rebirth. But they wanted to prolong the existence of the dead work. Uh, they wanted to use it as a school text. They wanted to use it as a text with commentary. They wanted to make it accessible to those who now contemplated it from the shores uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the revealed truth. They wanted to create a kind of artificial homeostasis uh, for the text, to surround it. And that's what you are looking at. This is two lines of Lucretius's poem, and the rest of this is just commentary, scholarly commentary <laughs> on the poem, and it goes like that uh, all the way through. So what they do is to create a kind of support system that completely surrounds the body of the text, at once sustaining it, keep, but also containing it. Uh, with uh, their assistance, 
uh, De Rerum Natura was on its way to becoming what this is, which is a school text, uh, a staple in the curriculum. And it was only in December of 1516, almost a full century after Poggio discovered the text, that the Florentine Synod, which was the influential group of clergymen that determined the syllabus uh, in Florentine schools, decided that this kind of homeostatic survival was a very bad idea. Uh, so they prohibited the reading of Lucretius in schools. Uh, they said the Latin was very nice, but the work should be banned as a lascivious and wicked work in which every effort is used to, de to demonstrate the mortality of the soul. And violators of the edict were threatened with eternal damnation and a fine of 10 ducats. Uh, the, the prohibition did, in fact, restrict circulation, and it bankrupted the poor guy who printed this quite expensive uh, edition. But it was too late to close the door. The scholarly editions had already appeared in Bologna, in Paris, in Venice, in Florence. Uh, they were, and it's very, very, they were moving about, and they're very, very difficult. Once, uh, as uh, many people have discovered, uh, once uh, works get into print, now we have other ways of, other, of suffering this, this unpleasant news. Once things get in print, it's almost impossible to drive them out. Uh, it was much easier in the old days of manuscript culture. You could burn a few manuscripts and kill a few scribes, and you could actually get things under control. But it was much more difficult to do uh, with the printing press. Um, if complete suppression proved impossible, there was some consolation in the fact that many editions came with kind of disclaimers of the sort of uh, don't try this at home disclaimers. <laughs> um, understand, says the great a French edition of the 16th century by Denis Lambin, understand that it's a poem. It's a great poem. It's an elegant, magnificent poem, a poem that all wise men uh, will praise. But understand that it is that. It's a poem. Um, once you understand that that's what it's for, uh, then the full force of that poetic merit can be acknowledged. It's a magnificent poem. And you can separate that sense from the ideas. As for those insane ideas, it's not difficult for us to refute them. Nor in truth is it necessary to do so. Certainly when they're most easily disproved by the voice of truth itself, meaning scripture, uh, or by everyone remaining silent about them. Everyone remaining silent about them. It's a kind of subtle warning. Sing the praises of the poem, but remain silent about its ideas. At least one of the readers of uh, Lambin's edition uh, was unable to or unwilling to remain silent about uh, the ideas in the poem. And that is uh, the person who owned this edition. That's the edition I've been quoting from. And this is his copy. And that person is the French essayist Michel de Montaigne, uh, whose copy of Lucretia survi uh, survives. And it's covered, as you can see, with hundreds, thousands, uh, of comments all over the text and over the dangerous bits as well as the less dangerous bits. What uh, uh, Montaigne's work is full uh, of quotations, Montaigne's essay full of quotations from uh, Lucretius, uh, clear fascination in the ceaseless movement of matter in the pursuit of pleasure. Uh, and Montaigne uh, carefully marked in the copy all of the places in the text that were, as he puts it in the margin, contre religion, against religion. In what spirit is not clear, genuinely not clear, and there's a debate among students of Montaigne about whether he's warning himself or just remarking with glee that something is against belief. It's very hard to tell. What we can tell is, first of all, that his reception was much, much more active than what I was talking about earlier, about this sort of blankness, and also that when he directly addresses uh, Lucretius, he directly addresses Lucretius's merits in terms that would not have frightened uh, Denis Lambin uh, or the others in his world. What he directly addresses is how fantastic Lucretius's Latin uh, is. Montaigne was a great Latinist. Actually, Latin was Montaigne's first language because of his slightly strange upbringing. Uh, and um, the uh, Montaigne had absolutely superb ability to understand what is magnificent in Lucretius's language. And in a great, a remarkable essay by Montaigne, 
uh, on, with a very dull title on some verses of Virgil, but it's an essay that should have been called On Sexual Intercourse. Uh, the, it's Montaigne's great essay on sex. He turns to Lucretius, who uh, wrote what the poet Yeats calls the greatest description of sexual intercourse ever written, uh, and adores it, but he adores it for its Latin. <laughs> when I ruminate that reicit, Pascit, inhians, moli, fovet, medullus, labefacta, perdet, percurrent, and that noble circumfusa, mother of the pretty infusus. I despise everything that else, everyone when else is doing that. Uh, so the aesthetic appreciation uh, of Lucretius, in fact, the whole, the whole ability to grapple with Lucretius depended on the possession of very good Latin. And thus the circulation of the poem was limited to a very small elite group everyone grasped that an attempt to make it more broadly accessible to the literate public would arouse deep suspicion and hostility from the authorities. So more than 200 years passed uh, before an attempt was actually made after the recovery of Lucretius uh, to translate uh, Lucretius into vernaculars. And that's another sign of the ways in which it was, the intolerable was contained. But by the 17th century, the, it was impossible to contain any longer. Uh, the philosopher Gassendi in France had a student uh, translate Lucretius. His student happened to be Moliere, uh, the great playwright. Unfortunately, the translation uh, is lost. Uh, there was an Italian translation, which the Catholic authorities, the church authorities, kept uh, for, out of print for decades, but was circulating privately. And in England, uh, first there was a translation of a... Uh, for a single book of Lucretius's poem, and then in 1682, uh, a complete translation uh, of uh, Lucretius was in print from this man, Thomas Creech. But first of all, take in the fact that between 1417 and 1682, there was no translation of work available in England, in English. Uh, this is a good slide, but not maybe good enough to enable you to see that in this beam of sunlight, there are thousands of little atoms coming down uh, on uh, the philosopher. Um, Creech's translation was greeted as an amazing achievement when it first appeared, but in fact, an English translation of almost the entire poem in couplets was already in very limited circulation and, and from a very surprising source, and this will lead us toward, uh, toward our third uh, point. The translation, which wasn't published until the 20th century, was by this woman, the Puritan Lucy Hutchinson, the wife, she doesn't look like yeah, she's in the grip of a mad pursuit of pleasure. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, she was the wife of, the, of Colonel John Hutchinson, who was a parliamentarian and regicide. And what's most striking, in a way, about uh, her amazing translation of the work is that by the time she presented the text to the Earl of Anglesey in 1675, she claimed that she detested every one of its principles and hoped that they would vanish from the face of the earth. So the question was why, when she uh, earnestly hopes that the wickedness will disappear, did she painstakingly prepare the verse translation and pay the professional scribe to write out the first five books and copy out the sixth book in her own hand and so forth? And her answer is a very revealing one. She says she did it out of curiosity, youthful curiosity, to understand things I had heard so much discourse of at second hand. So we get a sudden glimpse of the quiet conversations of which we have no record, of course, that were happening, as it were, in the other room among the men. Uh, and Lucy Hutchinson, who was uh, brilliant and serious and wanted to know what they were talking about, uh, set out to find out. Uh, and then uh, she does not pretend uh, that she was not interested uh, in the project. She didn't suppress what she found uh, out in the work. Uh, she tells us that she turned it into English in a room where my children practiced the several qualities they were taught with their tutors. That means the children were learning Latin uh, while she was translating the poem. Or they were learning their other subjects. And I numbered the syllables of my translation by the threads of the canvas I wrought in and set them down with a pen and ink that stood by me. What you'll notice here is that many women in the 17th century uh, were uh, very shy about admitting that they were writers. 
uh, wanting, it, it was a very complicated issue all through the Renaissance, how much women were willing to come forth as writers on their own. Uh, she makes it very clear that she is a woman uh, and that she is doing domestic tasks and at the same time uh, is translating this very difficult Latin poem uh, into verse. Uh, and why is she not embarrassed? Uh, she says that a masculine wit, John Evelyn, presented only a single book of the poem to the public, thought it was worth printing his head in a laurel crown. And now she's presenting the whole thing uh, to you. So she's extremely proud of the fact that she is a poet, a poet who deserves a laurel crown, and that crown is the key element to the survival and transmission of what was perceived by Hutchison herself and virtually everyone else to be intolerable. Uh, as we already saw, the thought police were not called very often to investigate paintings, uh, but it wasn't only a matter of formal censorship. Artists, most of whom thought of themselves as good Christians, were able, as artists, as painters and as poets, to explore in their work what, would not, what they wouldn't have found palatable as philosophical or ethical propositions. And the interesting thing, and it's really the key point I want to make, that it, an unexpected and surprising conjunction between toleration, dangerous ideas, in this case scientific ideas, and works of art. We don't necessarily think of works of art, we, we should think of them more often as carrying an enormous cognitive weight in our world of enabling things to happen, thoughts to happen. But this is exactly what happened uh, here. Uh, and Lucretius himself anticipated, strangely enough, precisely this effect. I told you already that very little of Epicurus survives. One of the very few things of Epicurus that survives is a saying that's in so-called Vatican maxims, I spit on poetry. Uh, Epicurus thought that philosophy should be written in prose. He very much disapproved of Empedocles, a, a pre-Socratic philosopher who wrote in poetry. He thought philosophy was a prose medium. Uh, and Lucretius wrote his Epicurean philosophy in poetry. Why? Uh, because he says that as physicians, when they seek to give young boys the nauseous wormwood, disgusting tasting medicine, first to touch the brim around the cup with the sweet juice and yellow of the honey, in order that the thoughtless age of boyhood be cajoled as far as the lips, and meanwhile swallow down the wormwood's bitter draft. So I am, rep I am presenting my work uh, in poetry. Art is linked to survival, to being able to take in, to swallow, what would otherwise be uh, unpalatable. The survival points to a further power in Lucretius's art, the realization that the universe consists of atoms and the void and nothing else, that the world was not made for us by a providential creator, that we're not the center of the universe, that our emotional lives are no more distinct from our, than our physical lives from those of all other creatures, that our souls are as material and mortal as our bodies, the realization of the nature of things, Lucretius thought, shouldn't bring with it a sense of cold emptiness, as if the universe had been robbed of its magic. He knew that people would say exactly what they did say when he came to them and said, your soul will die with your body, and that's good news. Uh, he knew that they would reject that thought. The origin of philosophy, he thought, should be the enhancement of pleasure and the enhancement of wonder. And that process uh, should be linked to the way in which human beings experience pleasure and wonder, and one of those ways is through art, uh, through painting, uh, and in his case, through poetry. The poetic greatness of Lucretius's work is not incidental to his visionary project. Uh, he didn't think that the tellers of truth uh, should not be allowed to tell truth in a beautiful way. He didn't think that only the tellers of fables uh, should be able to speak beautiful words or have beautiful works of art or beautiful buildings. Uh, without, uh, with the aid of poetry, the, the actual nature of things, 
an infinite number of indestructible particles swirling around, linking together, coming to life, coming apart, reproducing and dying and recreating themselves, forming an astonishing, constantly changing, erotic universe can be depicted in its true splendor. Uh, he thought that that endless world making and unmaking was the work of erotic energy, the energy of matter. Uh, and that belief, uh, that force of that belief, you can feel in strange places, uh, appropriated where you least expect it, as here, not exactly by Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, but by Mercutio uh, in Romeo and Juliet, who says, I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She's the fairy's midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman, drawn with a team of little atomies. Little atomies. Um, uh, in a play in which the young lovers have no hope uh, beyond this life and must consecrate all their energies into making a world of love in the here and now. It's in this spirit, perhaps, that Lucretius himself did something very strange, something that appears to violate his conviction that the gods are deaf to human petitions. Namely, his poem opens with a hymn, a prayer to Venus. We don't know how the German monks who copied these verses and kept them from destruction re responded. We don't know whether they had the impulse to carve in the, 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 in the poem the equivalent of that cross that was carved onto the head of Venus in the Getty. Uh, nor do we know what Poggio Bracciolini, who must at least have glanced at the poem, uh, thought that those verses to Venus meant. Uh, certainly, as I've said, almost every one of the poem's basic principles was anathema to all right-thinking uh, people. But the poetry was compellingly and seductively beautiful. And we can see with hallucinatory vividness what at least one uh, great English poet, a poet of impeccable Protestant credentials, uh, made of them. This is Spencer uh, in The Fairy Queen translating. Uh, this is only one of a uh, succession of uh, stanzas in which he translates literally, uh, incorporates into his poem Lucretius's great hymn to Venus. Great Venus, queen of beauty and of grace, the joy of gods and men, that under sky dost fairest shine and most adorn thy place, that with thy smiling look dost pacify the raging seas and makes the storms to fly. Thee, goddess, thee, the winds, the clouds do fear, and when thou spreads thy mantle forth on high, the waters play, and pleasant lands appear, and heavens laugh, and all the world shows joyous cheer. This is not an expression of toleration in any sense that Thomas More or John Locke would have understood. As I hope we've seen, toleration, only feebly present in this period, would not in any case have been extended to any of the key ideas re-entered circulation uh, with, on the nature of things. What occurred instead of toleration in the Renaissance was art. That power, the power of art, was made possible by what I've called this homeostatic prolongation of the ancient work provided by humanist scholarship, that heart-lung machine that they invented. But in the scholarly edition, the work was cadaverous, silent, still came alive, truly alive, only in moments such as the one we've just glimpsed in Spencer, uh, a brilliant stitching of the alien thing into the new body. A piece of the ancient pagan poem was cut out and kept alive and incorporated into a living work of art. The great Renaissance creators, the Spencer of this hymn to Venus, the Shakespeare of Romeo and Juliet, uh, the great essayist Montaigne, uh, or the Botticelli of the Primavera, were the masters not of toleration, but of this other thing, of idea-saving, life-saving, and enduring artistic rebirth. And it's that that we celebrate uh, in the Getty Villa today. It's that that we celebrate in the Renaissance. It's that that we celebrate in what came back into the world. Thank you very much.
Could you please uh, tell us a few words about uh, how this philosophy came through between Epicurus and Lucretius and who surrounded Lucretius in his world? Well, uh, the question, the, the first question of how it gets from Epicurus to Lucretius is in a way not so complicated uh, because the, as, as you may, may know, um, the, at a certain moment, the Romans went mad for Greek, all things Greek. Uh, they sent, uh, not only did they import uh, into Rome, especially, of course, after the conquest uh, of Greece, not only did they import wholesale enormous amounts of Greek art, uh, but they also did something that was, in some Romans thought, a fatal mistake, which was that they sent their children to Greek schools to study. And they also, as in the case of someone like Philodemus, they had uh, Greek teachers uh, come, they paid Greek teachers to come and teach children in Rome. And those teachers carried all of the Greek, basic Greek uh, philosophical schools uh, into the Roman world. And you can see uh, from works like Cicero's uh, conspectuses of, of philosophy, uh, you can see Cicero weighing one essentially Greek philosophical school against another. Cicero doesn't like uh, Epicureanism, but he grapples with, uh, with Epicureanism. It's clearly in the first century uh, of before the Christian era when Lucretius is writing, it's clearly one of the philosophical schools. Hence, the discovery in Herculaneum and the Villa of the Papyri of, of the works of Philodemus, and possibly even if a Norwegian papyrologist named uh, Kurt Kluvis had believed even the discovery of some fragments of Lucretius's poem itself. The question of who surrounded Lucretius is a harder one. Uh, we don't know really. What we know is that um, several of Lucretius's most sophisticated contemporaries were astonished by the power of his poem. Cicero himself, as I said, had no patience with Epicureanism, but thought the poem was remarkable and thought it was astonishing in combining poetry with science. And then Ovid and Virgil. Those, if you're going to choose three people to admire your work, that's not bad. <laughs> uh, so we know at least those three people. But beyond that, we know very little uh, about what we think is the case, uh, and that largely on the peculiar evidence, uh, I think it probably quite distorting evidence of, the, of what survived the uh, volcanic eruption of Vesuvius, what seems to be the case is that people in their villas in the, how should we say, Southern California landscape of uh, the Bay of Naples uh, seem to have a taste for Epicureanism, uh, for the pursuit of, of pleasure. <laughs> Because that's where the traces of this are. But beyond that, we, we don't, actually, we just don't know. He, Lucretius is a very mysterious character. We don't know almost anything about him. Uh, you, can you? What do you make of the uh, rather gory? Uh, it, it probably would be, yeah, because people yeah, in the back what, will hear what you. Do you. What do you make of the rather gory, uh, abrupt ending of the poem. Do you think that's how he meant to end it, or something was lost? Yes. The, the question refers to a, famous, to a famous problem in the poem. The poem, there's, there's some evidence. I'm no great Latinist, and I don't want to... This is, the world of, of this poem is a world of absolute 32nd degree lunatic Latinists. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not one. I wish I were. Uh, so the game is played at a very uh, high level, and it involves noticing certain uh, extremely tiny features that seem to indicate that the poem wasn't entirely finished. There are certain lines that are repeated, certain hypermetrical lines. Certain, uh, the, people have noticed for several centuries that there are, that there are some signs that the poem might have been left unfinished. Uh, and the, in one of the larger areas of, of debate, is the end of the poem, because the poem, which is, after all, about the pursuit of pleasure uh, and the erotic nature of the universe and so forth, ends with a horrendous account of the plague in Athens. Uh, a horrible account, uh, as you say, grim and gruesome, of how the plague works, how it takes over a city, how bodies rot in the street, and so forth and so on. So 
there are basically two different arguments. One is he meant to have a nicer ending, and he just didn't get around to doing it. <laughs> it, it, it was thought it, 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 that he might have committed suicide. That was what, what the Christians thought. Um, or uh, alternatively, as I guess I believe, but I don't, don't trust me on this one because, as I say, I don't want to pretend the knowledge I don't have. I, I believe, or I want to believe, that he sets up a test at the end of the poem as to how much you've actually got this, which is that it's not a soft philosophy. It's not about uh, just taking it easy. It's about understanding. It's, first of all, a poem written at a time that Rome was falling into basically civil war. Uh, the people who are in the, enjoying the poem in the Bay of Naples have escaped for a moment from uh, the, the, this, uh, the impending civil war to their villas, but they see what's happening. And this philosophy, if it works, will carry you through the worst thing, will carry you through the fact that it's not only going to be moments of, of sexual delight, but moments at which it's all coming apart. And I think that's the force of it. But it leads to something else that, so as not to be too sentimental about Lucretius, I want to say, which is that it's very hard, and one of the things that I don't like in Lucretius is that it's very hard to see why life, why being alive is better than not being alive in this philosophy. This is not, in that sense, a philosophy. It's, it, certainly while you're alive, the philosophy is that you should pursue pleasure. So that is clear. But it's not clear why being alive is a particularly important or attractive thing. Why it's better than being a rock or anything else. I mean, any other conjunction of atoms. There is, that is to say, at the very center of this philosophy, which I find incredibly beautiful and appealing, is something rather, to me, quite cold and frightening. Uh, and I think that it, Lucretius keeps coming back to this problem, and I think he, in effect, comes back to the problem at the end of the poem in a rather harsh way. Yes? That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, you may have just answered my question, but you know, I want you to be a bit of a philosopher. What, why is it so important, do you think, in a world that has a fair amount of material success, like the Renaissance, uh, to uh, not believe that love and connection can trump temporality? Well, I would have said, uh, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I don't know if I have a quick uh, answer to it. I would have said that the, uh, that several things. Uh, first of all, Renaissance is a big, complicated period. Uh, it's a world of of uh, um, of Michelangelo uh, or Pierre di Cosimo, but it's also a world of Savonarola, uh, who thought that you should throw these things in the bonfire. Uh, that the it, it has already, in its own internal structures, very deep contradictions and tensions that are actually intensifying uh, all through the 15th and 16th century. And I think what happened is that from, I'm no philosopher, but from my uh, perspective, certain things that were in tension all through actually starting in the late Middle Ages and that were getting increasingly uh, locked in with each other, that into that world came this extremely strange thing. A thing that couldn't be quite assimilated. As I said, I'm not pretending that the, po the poem suddenly swept the field from 1417. It didn't. It took centuries for even to whisper enough about it. But something started to happen. And what started to happen, from my point of view, was a disaggregation of the things that had been locked in that tension. The belief in the absolute atrocious abjection of humans, lump of sin, uh, and the glory of humans. Uh, the, the peculiar doubleness with which the late medieval Christian world had uh, passed along centuries of brooding and meditation about human suffering to the uh, artists of the 16th century. And I think, from my perspective, what happened, what lies in the... It is not what, what the importance of Lucretius is not what it did for the Renaissance. As I say, it just it weirdly passes through the Renaissance... It, that it passes through is amazing. It passes through in these surreptitious ways in works of art. But what lies on the other side 
even on the other side of Locke. You see, he was still trying to hold it back. But what lies on the other side is Darwin and Freud and Marx and Einstein. And I might turn the question back on you and say, is that good for us? I think it is because I think it's closer to what I take because of who I am to be not the truth, but closer to the truth. Uh, but is it actually good for us? We can't ask that question. We have to embrace the truth as we think we, uh, we see it, we understand it. And I think that is the work that this poem did, thanks to the Renaissance passing it along.